Today we're going to begin a new series. Yep, you guessed it. I'm going to be speaking for a few weeks in a row. I'm calling this series Living Like a Champ. And in this series, we're going to take a fresh look at what it truly does mean to live like a believer, to live like a Christian. Because the fact of the matter is, most people don't really know how to live. They simply exist, they vegetate, they endure. Even many Christians who have maybe been in church for many years truly don't know what real Christian living is. It's like they just float through life, biding their time, waiting for heaven to start their living. But that's clearly not what God has in store for our lives. This life isn't just an obstacle that we have to get past. God didn't breathe life into man and surround this earth with an atmosphere so there would be dead air space. In other words, just a pointless uh, void of time lacking any content or purpose. No, God himself wants us before eternity dawns in our lives to get the most out of this life. In fact, that's why we have the Bible, I believe. Because this is our how-to book for life. If this life wasn't important, he'd have never went to the trouble, and we wouldn't have the Bible today. I mean, let's just do a review here, if you don't mind, before we get into this. Let's consider, really, what I believe is the awesome uniqueness of the Bible. I don't think we stop to consider that enough. First, it actually covers 6,000 years of human history, some of which were prophecies about the future from that moment in time when they were actually written. And now looking back, we can see that they came to pass exactly as the Word of God said. In fact, some of the things written in this book about the future are unfolding in our time right now, and some things are still yet to happen, but it covers 6,000 years of human history. It was written over a 1,500-year period covering 40 generations. It was written by 40 different writers or contributors. I don't call them authors because God is the author, but 40 different writers from kings to peasants, from philosophers to fishermen, poets, statesmen, and many other varied backgrounds. It was written in a variety of places, not just in some office somewhere. It was written in the wilderness, in dungeons, part of it, in palaces, on military campaigns. It was written during times of war and times of peace, in times of joy and times of despair. It was written on three different continents, Asia, North Africa, and European. It's in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And yet, for all of that, there is not one contradiction or failed prophecy. And further, just as no other race of people has had as many attempts made to annihilate them from the face of the earth as the Jews have, okay, and Napoleon... He called the continued existence of the Jews, even in his time, the greatest miracle of all time, for that very reason. Because long before Hitler and the Holocaust, people had been trying to wipe out the Jews, and still are, as evidenced by what's happening with Iran right now. But just as the Jews have prevailed against complete destruction, so too, so too has the Word of God. For I submit to you this morning without any fear of reservation or error or contradiction. No other book in all of human history has been persecuted and pursued for the purposes of complete destruction, as much as the Bible has been, and yet it prevails still today as the number one best-selling book of all time. It's the single most printed and circulated book ever. But, Getting back to my initial point, living a full, vibrant, and effective life on this planet, in the here and now, in other words, getting the most out of this life, is clearly God's design for us. And the very existence and the preservation of the Bible 
I think, is definitive proof of that fact. But then, not only does the Bible itself testify to this truth, but God himself testifies to this fact. And he demonstrated it when 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born into this world. For you see, getting the most out of life, and I don't know if you've ever stopped to, write, uh, to realize this or not, but getting the most out of life is one of the reasons why Jesus came. I mean, he came for this reason. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In other words, the Bible teaches us that God came in the person of the Son, Jesus the Christ, to redeem and reconcile fallen mankind back into a relationship with himself. Because of our sin, it separates us from a holy and righteous God. Basically, Jesus came to say, one by one, Father, as they accept me as their Savior, I, Jesus said, absorb the consequence of their wrongdoing, their sin, into myself, and I'm going to take it to the grave. I'm going to die in their stead. That's what Jesus basically was doing when he came. And Christ could accomplish this because God himself in the person of the Son, well, the grave could not hold him. And on Easter morning, as Jonah shared with us just a few weeks ago, he arose victorious over death. And I'm going to move on in just a minute and get to the real meat of this message today, but I don't want anyone to leave here this morning not fully understanding the redemptive work of the cross. It's the real reason why we preach anything. You see, you are not this physical covering of flesh. You are an eternal spiritual being that was born into this world through the flesh. In other words, the real you is what's referred to as the soul. That's the real you. And like God in whose image we are created, you are eternal. And what sin has done is it has separated us because God cannot be a part of anything sinful. Sin in our lives has separated us from a holy and righteous God. And that separation is not just temporal in the here and now, but it even continues after this covering of flesh has played out. In other words, you know what I'm talking about, death. And in the spiritual realm, because what death of the flesh does is it releases the spiritual realm, our soul into the spiritual realm. Well, in the spiritual realm, the dimensions of time and space are much different. And basically, in the spiritual realm... Once death has come to this flesh, we're going to find ourselves, our soul, who we are, in one of two places, either with God in heaven or without God, the abyss, the bottomless pit, often referred to as hell. And what Jesus did in taking our penalty upon himself is he took our place in hell. So that now we are cleared of the consequences of our sin. And as Christians, as Christ followers, born again, the saved, believers, redeemed, however you want to characterize those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, our trust in Jesus as Lord, now we go to the Father once we are released from this body of flesh by physical death. That's what this verse means. Next. But we do see Jesus who was made, and talking about his incarnate human birth, who was made lower than the angels. Why do we say that? Because of the mortalness of flesh and blood. For a little while, Jesus came in the flesh for a little while, but now, having resurrected, he is crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Notice, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, this verse is not saying that Christ tasted physical death in our stead so that we don't have to die, because obviously Christians still die physically, but he tasted spiritual death, hell, 
so that we don't have to. And Jesus was not, Jesus was not a human soul encapsulated in the flesh as we are, but Jesus, of course, was God in the flesh. And being God with unlimited potential, He is able to take the place of any and all who seek Him. Romans 6.10 says this, The death He died, He died to sin once for all. Now, if Jesus were not God and He were just a godly man, He couldn't be the Savior of mankind. Because if he was only a man, then the best he could possibly do would be to take the place of one man. But Jesus, who is God and omnipotent and omnipresent, can take everybody's place. And since he is God, hell could not hold him as it would us. And that's what the Bible means in Revelation 1.18 where it says, When I saw him, this is the Apostle John writing, When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. Talking about the resurrected Christ. Then he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive forever. I have the keys of death and hell. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible also says this, But thanks be to God who gives us, not only does Jesus have the victory, but who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, this is the significance of Christ's death on the cross and His resurrection. But He didn't just come to seek and to save the lost. He also came in order that we might experience the most out of this life in the here and now. Remember this verse from a few weeks ago. Jesus said, I have, came that, I have came that they might have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus didn't say, I came that people might have religion. Or, I came that people might have more rules and regulations. But he said, I came that you might know how and to be able to get the most out of this life. And so this morning, in pursuit of living like a champ, I want to share a message with you I've entitled, Living Life as a Positive Person. And we're going to explore this in the book of Romans, chapter 8. And some of you probably already did a study uh, on this with Jonah on Wednesday night. But we're going to look at the Romans, chapter 8. And a few weeks ago, I read about a guy named Dr. Martin Siegelman. And he's a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And after having studied thousands and thousands of people, he came to this conclusion. People who are optimistic and people who are positive live longer, have better health, are more happy, and accomplish more in their life than people who are not. Another study I read determined that salesmen who are optimistic have 37% more sales than guys who are not optimistic. This probably explains why Mark is very good at his job. He's a very positive, optimistic person. And further, here's something else. It's just a simple truth. But people in general, we kind of like to be around positive people, don't we? Yeah, I I know I've said this before, but let me just reiterate this again. I think Christians, of all people, ought to be the most positive and optimistic people on the planet because we have so much to hope for. Someone once called Christians hope addicts, and I think that's a good term. And I believe that a pessimistic Christian is not only an insult to God, but a cancer in the church body. And I say that because of what we're going to look at today in Romans chapter 8. It gives us, Romans chapter 8, the seven reasons why every Christian ought to be the most optimistic person in the world. So I want you to notice with me, Romans chapter 8, and I want you to notice with me verse 31. 
What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the awesome privilege once again of standing here in this pulpit and addressing this congregation. Father, I pray that the words I share would indeed be found faithful to the message that you have put on my heart and that you've led me in. Help me to bring it to your people with clarity. And may nothing I say or do in this moment get in the way of that. Speak, Lord Jesus, through this message, for your people are listening. And we ask it and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, the key phrase in that chapter that we're going to look at today are two little words. The key phrase are the two words, in Christ. That's Paul's favorite term for a Christian. In fact, 164 times in the New Testament, it says we are in Christ. And because we are in Christ, God has made it possible for us to live positively in this world. And so let's take note of seven reasons why, as a Christian, we should be positive in life. Here's number one. It's a life without condemnation. Notice Romans 8.1. The Bible says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's that word in the Greek, that word no, it's called auden. And it's the strongest word, quantitatively speaking, for no in the entire Greek language. It means absolutely, positively, never. Not even one. Nothing. And folks, that's good news. For all the wrong that I know I have done in my life, to know that God does not hold me accountable once I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's good news, folks. That when he looks at my life, he sees me as a perfect and innocent child of God. It's an amazing thing. It's almost too good to really believe, but it is the truth. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross that I was talking about earlier. And if Jesus paid for our sins, then we don't have to pay for them too. That would be double jeopardy. Jesus said of the Father in John 3, 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There's just one condition we have to meet. Let's notice chapter 8, verse 1 again. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus no condemnation. We can't earn it. We just accept it when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but did you know along the Via Della Rosa, that means the way of the cross, it's the pathway that Jesus took through Jerusalem to Golgotha where he was crucified. Did you know that along the Via Della Rosa there stands a church called the Church of Flagellation? Flagellation means whipping, scourging, beating. It's true. This church really does exist. It was built in the 1920s, and it's located at the first of the 14 stations of the cross. Now, you say, well, I, I've never heard of that before, the stations of the cross, and that's maybe not surprising. Uh, this is a tradition and observance that is held to mostly by the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, and a couple of other Protestant denominations. But the point is, there is this church called the Church of Flagellation, of whipping, of scourging, of beating. Folks, I think there are churches like that in America today. You go to church for worship on Sunday, and the pastor in his messages beats you up week after week. In fact, some people don't really feel like they've been preached to unless they've been giving, given a verbal going over. 
I mean, I've had people come up to me after maybe a, a difficult message at times and say, Pastor, that message was so good, you really stepped on my toes today. I feel so bad. Well, how unfortunate if that's the kind of worship you're expecting or looking for. I think it's crazy to feel like you haven't been to worship and left, you know, you've been run over by a bulldozer. That's not the preaching I see that Jesus was doing in the New Testament, not to the people he was trying to reach. He wasn't yelling at them and putting them down. Now, he would let the hypocrites and the Pharisees and the scribes have it pretty good. But I think it's crazy to feel like you haven't been to worship unless you've been run over by a bulldozer. Because God made it possible for his people to live without condemnation. And then notice, that passage we read, it didn't say there are no mistakes for those who are in Christ Jesus. It didn't say uh, th there are no sins or failures for the, obviously, Christians, we sin, we fail, we make mistakes. Christians are not perfect, but we are forgiven. And if we just stopped, I think, right here, closed our Bibles and went home, that, I think, is in of itself is enough reason for you and I to live positively in this world. But fortunately, we don't have to do that because I've got six more reasons to share with you on why you can be positive in this world. Here's number two. The Christian life is a life without domination. Notice Romans 8.2. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. I've spoken to a lot of people during my years in ministry whose common complaint is, my life is out of control. I just can't get a handle on my life. I know what I ought to be doing, but I just can't seem to break free. And for you, maybe that's a, a way of thinking. Maybe it's a way of acting. Maybe it's a way of responding. Maybe, maybe it's a habit. But I'll tell you what, the mark of a genuine Christian it's freedom. The Bible says this. Now the Lord, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so my question for you this morning is this: What's controlling you? And you know, even without really knowing what a person is like, I can make a pretty good guess. Just tell me what you think about the most, because whatever you think about the most is what controls you. If, you if, if sex is what you think about the most, then you're probably into pornography or adultery if you're married or fornication if you're unmarried. Or worse, you might be a, a pervert or an offender or a rapist if sex is what you're thinking about all the time. If money's what you think about most, unless you know, you're an accountant or an, an investor or maybe you're somebody who's struggling day after day to make ends meet. Yeah, you're going to have money on your mind a lot, but unless you're one of those things and you think about money all the time, you're probably a greedy person, probably a miser, stingy. If bowling or fishing or shopping or weekend getaways is what you think about all the time, I guarantee you, you spend a lot of time doing those things and a lot of your life choices revolve around those things. They have a hold on your life. Don't kid yourself. Notice what the Bible says in Romans 8, 5. To have your mind controlled by human nature results in death. It's no way to live, the Bible says. To have your mind controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. Here's the point. You are going to be controlled by something in life. Your own nature, the devil, something. But the amazing thing is, the more I let God control my life, the more freedom I actually experience. For when I am mastered by the master, then I become master of my circumstances. Because again, as a believer, God has made it possible for me to live a life without domination. I gain control of my life and circumstances by giving them to the Lord. Here's another reason why or how I'm able to live a positive life as a Christian. Because number three, I live life without desperation. 
The writer Henry David Thoreau said, most people live their lives in quiet desperation. And that's because life is not easy. Life is tough. God has not promised a stress-free, problem-free life for a believer. However, Christians do have a hope that helps us keep going. Romans 8.18 says this, Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul says, I know how this story called life is going to end. There are going to be rewards for me. Sure, I'm going to go through some tough times, Paul said, but in the here and now, but I've read the back of the book, and I know I'm going to win in the end. Which is why, as a Christian, I have hope to hold on to even in my problems, even when things are going wrong, even when things are falling apart. I mean, who here likes to lose? I, I just love losing. Probably nobody. Right? But don't, what if I said to you, don't worry, even if you lose a dozen times early on, I promise, I guarantee you that at the end of the tournament, I'm going to make sure you win it all and the prize is yours. Now, if I were able to tell you that, do you think you could maintain a positive attitude even in the midst of some of those early losses? Well, absolutely. That's how it is for us as Christians. I'm going to have some losses in this life. Hold on, because I'm going to win in the end. And so, as a Christian, I can live positively because I live life without condemnation, without domination, without desperation. Here's number four. I live a life without miscalculation. And here's my point. God never makes a mistake. And, and he even takes the mistakes that we make and he weaves them into his purpose. Everything fits into his plan. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. No wonder Christians can be positive. That, that verse should make an optimist out of everybody. And notice it says, and we know. It doesn't say we wish, we desire, we think, we imagine. We have absolute confidence. We know. And notice further, it doesn't say all things by themselves are good. It says they work together. They're interrelated. Individually, there are many bad things that come into our lives, but they work together. You know, my, my dad died. That was not a good thing in my life at that moment. But let me tell you something, that loss drove me to seek Christ. God brought good out of it. I practically cut off my thumb one time with a table saw. It was... <laughs> I cut, it, I cut it pretty bad, and I can remember, you know, being in the hospital there, just holding it with a rag around it, you know, and uh, I said to the doctor, because I'm kind of a wimp, and uh, so I said, could, could you put me out for these stitches? And he said, we don't put people out for stitches, but you need more than that, so you're going to go out, and they gave me some kind of a shot, and the last thing I remember on that gurney being taken into the operating room was I started... Uh, I said, Doc, and he said, yes, and he was walking alongside. I said, this hurts b -b 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 bad to the bone. <laughs> yeah. Finished putting him out. You know. well, anyway, I cut my thumb, you know, and, and I couldn't work. And uh, so, you know what I did during that time? I just started reading the Bible more and more and more and praying more. And I felt compelled to answer the call to preach that I had had God ask me or tell me many months earlier, I felt called to preach, but I was resisting it. It was kind of like Robert De Niro saying, are you talking to me? You can't be talking to me. But he got a hold of my life. Cutting my thumb wasn't a good thing, but God worked it out for good. They're interrelated. In other words, we must look at the whole picture. If you look at needlepoint and you look at the back side of it, you just see this jumbled mess of, 
uh, of, of twine and everything all, but if you turn it over and you see the beautiful picture it is, it's the perspective that we're looking at that makes the difference. So here's a question. Can God take even the sin that I've done in my life? Can God take even the sin, the wrong things, the bad, the dumb, the, the, the stupid decisions, can He take those and fit them into His plan? The answer is yes. I mean, here's just an example. Consider the book of Matthew chapter 1. That's the genealogy of Jesus. From Abraham all the way to Mary, his mother, other than Mary, there are only four women mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy. And that's because of Jew in Jewish history, they did the, the genealogy, the family line. They recorded it through the fathers. But there are four women, other than Mary, mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. Now, who are those four women? Tamar. She was seduced by her father-in-law and bore a child. Not exactly an ideal situation. Rahab, she's mentioned. She was a prostitute. Ruth is mentioned. She was a Moabite, a foreigner who married a Jew illegally. And then, of course, Bathsheba, and we all know about her. Here's the point. Out of those four women who had terrible experiences in their life, God used them, in spite of the negatives, to be incredible participants in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And not only did God use them, He didn't just use them and say, but let's not talk about them. He put them right there in the Bible, in the lineage. Isn't that incredible? Isn't it good news to know you don't have to be perfect the rest of your life to be in God's plans? Isn't it great to know that even though you make mistakes, God will fit it in? The bottom line is, as a Christian, I can always be positive because God guarantees everything that touches my life, no matter how bad it is, no matter whose fault it is, He will blend it together with all the other factors and elements of my life until it ultimately comes out for good. Here's number five. It's a life without intimidation. That's why I can be positive. Let's go back to our opening verse. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? God says, I will protect you. He's saying one plus me always equals a majority, always brings a victory, regardless of who's against us. Have you discovered this wonderful truth? That God not only knows you, but God is for you? He wants you to make it. He wants you to succeed. That's good news. He's not, he's not trying to make our lives miserable with all these standards for us to live by. He's not trying to trip us up. He's not trying to, to make our lives a mess. God is for us. Let me ask you this one. What do you fear the most? Failure? The future? Maybe you fear dying. Maybe you fear rejection. Maybe you fear criticism. Well, whatever it is, Hebrews 13.6 says this. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? In Romans 8, 37, the Bible says this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Literally in the Greek, that means super conquerors. That's why the Apostle Paul could also write this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is living life without intimidation. And as believers, that's the life we have as well. God loves us so much. You can't even imagine how much He loves you. He's 100% for you all the time. Here's number six. It's a life without limitation. 
the Christian life is. That's why I can live life as a positive person. Notice this passage in verse 32. Since he did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us all, won't he also surely give us everything else? When God the Father sent Jesus the Son to die on the cross for our sins, he solved our biggest problem. Eternity in hell, eternal separation from God because of our sin. He solved it. Everything else, folks, everything else is minor by comparison. That verse is telling us, if God loves you enough to send Jesus Christ to die for you, don't you think he loves you enough to care about your bills? Don't you think he loves you enough to care about the problems you're having with your kids? Don't you think he loves you enough to help you in any circumstance you're facing? If God paid the ultimate sacrifice by sending Jesus, let me tell you, for him, everything else we face is small potatoes. So here's the fact. God is telling us he will meet all our needs. And that isn't just about financial things. It's emotional. It's it's our spiritual needs, our social needs. It may be physical As a Christian, it doesn't matter. The Bible says this. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches by Christ Jesus. All your needs. I like Psalm 84. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God wants to bless our lives. I'll never forget the first time I learned how to to give, to tithe by faith. Some of you have heard this because I speak about it often, but I always will until he calls me home. But it was Palm Sunday many, many years ago. I wasn't a pastor. I had answered the call, but I wasn't a pastor yet. My son was two years old, maybe two and a half. And it was Palm Sunday when we went to, to church that day. Now, let me tell you, at that time in my life, I worked full time in a supermarket bakery. I wasn't the manager yet. I just was one of the people that worked there. My wife was a clerk at St. John's Hospital in Springfield. We didn't make much money. I couldn't even afford to shop at the grocery store I worked at. We had to go to this store that was kind of like a a ruler or an Aldi, only it was the size of like a Sam's. But it wasn't a box store. It was just a big discount store. It's where we had to go, and we would get just enough for seven dinners, a few lunches, and what Teddy needed. And that that was it. We paid our bills, and I wrote the tithe check. We got paid every two weeks. I wrote the tithe check for two two weeks. We had just a few bucks in the bank. I don't mean we had a savings, and we just had a few bucks in the checking. We had a few bucks in the bank in the checking account for gas. I went to church that Sunday. Next Sunday was Easter. We didn't have a thing for Ted. And I didn't have the money. But we went to church on Palm Sunday, and uh, I had my tithe check in my hand. And they had a contest that day at church. And they didn't tell you what the prize was. They said they'd announce it at the end of the service with the winner. But I entered the contest. But during the service, I put in my tithe check. Didn't know what we'd do for Easter for Ted. And, And let me tell you about when I was at that age, what life was like. Um, and this is for anybody who's maybe under 55. In, in that era, as a young adult, nobody used credit cards at a grocery store. I mean, it was cash or check. You couldn't even pay for something with a credit card at a grocery store if you wanted to. There was no such thing as that. People certainly didn't put credit cards in a Coke machine or anything like you can today. There was no Vimo. There was no PayPal. You know, back in that day, we didn't even buy bottled water when you could drink it basically for free, out of a tap or a faucet, right? Our jeans, when we bought them, they weren't wholly and faded. They were new. But it was just a different time. Um, If you needed money, you know what we didn't do? We didn't run home to mom and dad every time we needed 10 bucks or 20 bucks. We just didn't do it. And there was no GoFundMe sites to put up. I would have sold something. As we got closer to Easter, I would have just sold something, or I would have taken something to the pawn shop, which I had done before. But anyway, we go to church, put in the tithe check, 
Didn't have any money, didn't know what we'd do for Easter. I won the contest, folks. And you know what the prize was? It was a gift certificate to a candy store. And so my son had an Easter basket that year. Do you think that made a believer out of me when it came to giving? You bet. That was one of the very first experiences in my life where I learned to give when I didn't have it to give. Because I don't just wear a bracelet that says, I am second. I am second. That's how I live my life. God is first. And since then, I can tell you that I've seen it over and over. And God's ways are not our ways. We think the way to get is to grab. And God says, no, the way to get is to give to me. That's what trust is all about. That's what trust is all about. Finally, then, here's one last reason why and how I can and should be a positive person in this life and live a positive life. Number seven, I live a life without separation. I want you to notice what I mean by that in verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Paul says, I am more convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today's, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord If we really embrace that truth, it will totally revolutionize our lives. Nothing can ever destroy our relationship with God. What good news is that? That as long as I continue to love and trust Him, nothing that could ever happen to me, nothing I could ever do, will cause God to stop loving me. By committing my life to Christ, I don't ever have to wonder, am I going to make it in the end? Am I really going to go to heaven? Am I truly saved? I don't ever have to wonder that because it doesn't depend on us. It depends on God. Here's what Jesus said in John 15. Remain in me. I will remain in you. And in 2 Timothy, Paul writes this. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed him until that day. God won't let go, and neither can any circumstance or created being take me from God. Remember what Jesus said in this next passage. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anything else or anyone else. So no one can kidnap them from me. I and the Father are one. The bottom line bottom line is this, as long as my desire is for him, because God always honors free will and he doesn't force people to himself. As long as my desire is for him, I am safe in Christ. What a comfort knowing that no matter what I face in the future, I will not face it alone. God is with me He has promised me, I will never leave you or forsake you. In the 139th Psalm, it says this, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take to the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. 